quickie project. I've been asked by a relative to help them with their dehumidifier since their lower level of their tri-level house uh, gets pretty humid in the summer. They don't run air conditioning down there. There's no air circulation. It just gets humid. So they have a dehumidifier, but they have trouble getting up the stairs. Uh, so they really hate going down there to empty the dehumidifier. And of course the tank on it fills up two or three times a day and therefore it mostly just sets in its self shutdown mode and doesn't actually dehumidify anything. So I know that they make these condensate pumps for air conditioning units. This is one of the more popular ones. It's the so-called Little Giant. They actually have a number of different models of these. And uh, I had a heck of a time deciphering to figure out which one to buy. And I finally settled on this VCMA 15 ULST. Uh, they have two different series in the VCMA line. One of them is the Dash 15 and the other is the Dash 20. Where this Dash 15 subseries is the smaller of the two in terms of horsepower and pumping capability, and it has a 150th horsepower motor in it. Then the Dash 20 subseries has a 130th horsepower motor in it, so it can pump up higher to wherever the discharge point is. But even this one can pump at least one story of a house. For example, if your dehumidifier is in the basement, you need to pump it up to ground level to discharge, or even up into the next floor and tap it into a drain line or something. You could do that, and it would have enough power to do it. Uh, so, in my relative's house, all I'm doing is really pumping it across the floor and then up into a utility sink, maybe uh, 15, not even that, maybe 10 feet away. So, um, this is an Amazon bestseller. I checked the local hardware stores, big boxes. Nobody stocked these things, but they all could get them. I wanted it a little quicker, and Amazon had next day delivery. So, um, I ordered this Dash 15 model, and then the UL, they all seem to have the UL part after the 15, and then the ST is important, and you can find a lot of these sold without the ST on them, or with only the S, or only the T, or whatever. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about what that means here, because it might help somebody else out who's trying to figure out which of these models to buy. Basically, these things are a electrically operated pump. So there's a pump motor, the pump itself, and then the reservoir down here. It holds half a gallon. All of these in the VCMA series hold half a gallon. And there are three different places where you can let water go into the tank. And it comes with two hole plugs, so you can plug the two you aren't using and then just use the, the one that's positioned the most appropriately and they're big enough to run PVC pipe down into or a hose or whatever. Or you can actually run multiple condensate sources into these, you know, using all three holes if you want to, and just not even use the hole plugs. Um, and then it all pumps out with this uh, check valve here. This is actually a check valve with a 3 8 inch hose barb on it. And let me talk some more about the way the pump works. This is just like any sump pump, just small. So there's a float switch inside the reservoir here, or the tank, and once the level gets up nearly full, it switches on and pumps everything out until it only has maybe, I don't know, half of an inch or an inch of water left in the bottom. It doesn't go completely dry, and it pumps it out, and because of the check valve, nothing can run back into it. They do recommend that you use the discharge line in some way that has a bit of a siphoning effect, so it should pump higher and then go back downhill a little bit so that it helps draw fluid out of the hose rather than have it all sit back uh, pushing on the check valve. But even if you can't do that, it still works. Anyway, so if you get a model that has the S like down here, the S after the UL, that means it has a second switch in it. 
so there's two float switches, not just one. And the second float switch is the high, high level. So, for example, if uh, the power is turned off to this, or it, the pump fails or something, and it can't pump, then the water level will eventually rise to the high, high level, and it'll actuate that secondary switch, which is brought out to two wires here. And those can be hooked up to whatever you want um, to either stop the inflow of condensate water to this so it doesn't overflow, or to generate an alarm to let you know that there's a problem. You can use it either way. Uh, so that's one thing, and I selected the one with the S on it, and that was indeed one of the Amazon's, uh, what do they call it, Amazon... I forget what they call it, but it's it's a uh, what Amazon's terminology is for a best seller, and the price is about fifty dollars on this model, by the way. And then the T there means that it has a hose. So if you don't have the T, then it doesn't come with a discharge hose. If you get the T on the model number, then it comes with a twenty-foot long, three-eighths inch inner diameter discharge hose, clear plastic hose that you can run 20 feet away. Now if you need to run more than 20 feet, then you probably need to go out to the hardware store and buy a longer hose with a 3 8 inch ID. Uh, but if you're in a position like my relative's house where there's a utility sink 10 feet away, 20 feet will be more than enough to go over there, go up, and then over the edge of the sink and into the sink. So um, that's what the model numbers mean. If you don't have the S, then you don't get the secondary switch. If you don't have the T, then you don't get the 20-foot hose. Everything else being the same. Now about this switch, as it comes, the secondary level switch, the high, high level switch, is wired out in such a way that the contacts of the switch are closed most of the time. They're normally closed, in other words and you're supposed to wire this into, for example, the controller of your air conditioning unit. Uh, in other words, you could wire it up in series with the contact from your thermostat that normally turns the air conditioner on and off. So if this does get a high, high level in it, the switch will open up and that will tell the air conditioner to stop running and therefore stop generating condensate water and then you're good, but you wouldn't get any notification of it until you just happen to notice your air conditioner is not running and then you have to go troubleshoot and figure out it's because of this being full of water. Um, I chose to make it do an alarm instead and the way that's done is I'm going to show how to open this up. There are two slide tabs here and here and you might be tempted to push on those with a screwdriver but that's not the way it works. Over here there's a single screw You remove that one screw and then you slide the housing back until it disengages the tabs. And now you can see that there's the split phase motor down here and the fan for it and then the uh, actual pump is down inside the tank. The shaft from the motor goes through. You can see it's a pretty good quality unit. Um, anyway, here's the power cord coming in, and it goes through a strain relief. The ground goes to the only metallic thing on here, which is the housing of the motor. It uh, doesn't go anywhere else. And the neutral goes through the blue wire to one side of the motor. The brown, which uh, I believe is the hot, goes through. This is the primary float switch here. And that operates this switch. So the hot comes in, it goes through the switch, and then it goes to the other side of the motor. So when the level rises to high level, not high, high level, just regular high level, it operates the switch, turns the motor on, it runs the pump until it comes back down 
you can see where it clicks there that's when it engages then it has the float has to drop down to there before it disengages the switch so that's what's called hysteresis so the turn on and turn off point are not the same level on the float it has to be pretty high in the tank to turn it on and it has to drop pretty low before it turns it off so that's the way the pump works now the secondary switch and the secondary float is this one you can kind of see the I don't know it looks like foam or something float down there and it comes to this secondary uh, switch here and um, you can probably hear the clicking there this doesn't seem to have any hysteresis on it and it doesn't need it since all it's doing is turning on or activating the switch at the high high level so obviously if you get the model that doesn't have the S in the part number then this float and this secondary switch aren't even in here as it comes this top wire here that I'm pointing at with the screwdriver is actually on this other tab of the switch that I'm pointing at right here and that's the normally closed contact so what you have to do is grab that with a needle nose pliers and wiggle it off of there and then stick it on the upper tab of the switch which is the normally open contact and what that does then is when the float rises to the high high level it closes the contacts that these two wires go to and now you can use it to energize an alarm of your choice so now I'm going to talk about the alarms for alarming a high high level you want something loud enough that you can hear it and something readily available one of the first things that occurs to me is you can just go to the hardware store and buy a traditional doorbell you know um, and those are usually transformer operated so you buy the little doorbell transformer you buy the doorbell and you wire it up according to the instructions just the way you would for a normal doorbell except instead of the switch by the front door you wire it up to these two wires and then whenever the level gets to high high here the switch will close it'll operate the doorbell and it'll probably go ding dong once if it's like a normal bell some of them uh, operate in a repetitious fashion and they will go ding dong ding dong ding dong like that as long as the switch is closed some models won't so if you're going to do the doorbell thing you need to make sure that uh, it's one that will continuously ring as long as the contacts are closed so that would be one way of doing it in other ways you can get one of these high level water detectors that is intended to go next to a sump pit in your basement and uh, that sends off an alarm if the water level crests for example the edge of the sump pit uh, and it's le you know it sounds off kind of an electronic shriek that hopefully gets your attention and you could wire one of those up they typically have two electrical connections on them either two metal plates or two wires that just sort of lay on the floor and you could wire these contacts through these wires here up to those and as far as that device would be concerned a high high level on here would make that uh, alarm device think that there's water right at it and it'll go off and make a, the loud uh, alert sound so that's another way of doing it the way I'm gonna do it is I've got one of these sound alert type devices this one's Mallory but there's a million of these things they're all easily available um, I decided I'm going to use a pack of four double A cells which gives me six volts and I dug through my junk box until I found a Mallory Sonalert alert that has the six volt rating on it but again there's a ton of these electronic buzzers that you can buy in many different versions they're dirt cheap and most of them are pretty loud so that's one way of doing it you could also dispense with this and get a uh, uh, one of these wall power adapters even the 5 volt ones that are common now because of USB would probably work the alarm wouldn't be quite as loud but it would still work or you could get one that has 6 volt output and then you could use that instead of the batteries but then you know what happens if you 
have a trip breaker, you know. I think the batteries are probably the most robust in the sense that they'll always work and they'll run a buzzer like this for a long time before the batteries are deple depleted. And you don't have an extra power cord running and so on. So that's the reason I've decided to, to do it this way uh, for this one installation. Now I should say something else about this switch. According to the instructions, it is not rated to operate something like a motor. Um, it is not a high powered switch. I don't know what its actual ratings are, but uh, strangely enough that the switch that's used to turn on this motor is a smaller switch physically than this one, but they still say that they recommend it's used either to trigger an alarm device or to cut off the control for the air conditioning unit that's generating the condensate water. Both of those would be pretty low power, low current type of uh, electrical connections. So I wouldn't trust this thing to turn on something big like a secondary pump or anything like that, not without going through an interposing relay that could handle more power. So that's just a cautionary note. So I've already changed the switch over here to the normally open configuration. I've wired my battery pack so the positive lead goes into one of the float switch wires. The other float switch wire comes out and goes to the sone alert and then the sone alert's black wire returns to the black wire on the battery pack. I'm not even sure if this thing cares what the polarity is but I'm trying to maintain it just in case it does. So um, when we get the float switch coming up when the float switch goes down it turns off float switch comes up So that's pretty simple and it's pretty loud. I know that I can hear this in another room, not all the way across the house maybe, but certainly in another room or at the top of the stairs. So it's loud enough for that. Uh, and obviously this signal could go a long distance. You don't have to have the sound alert right next to the pump. It's a low voltage signal, it's safe. It's just run off of a few batteries. You could easily run the wires up to a completely different part of your house and put the actual sone alert up there and it would work just fine. So the trick now is how to mount all this stuff in a way that's just not laying on the floor. Putting the housing back on you want to make sure that the wires are in the strainer leaf here and that keeps them lined up with the slot in the case. Come over here and you set it down and just a little bit to the left then slide it to the right it's a little hard to do with one hand. Actually, you'd get hung up on this. Uh, there we go. It's easier to take the cover on and off with these hole plugs taken out. So that's there. These two wires are going through their slot. And I just need to put that one screw back in. Now one interesting point about these little giant pumps is that they normally would be sat on the floor but they can also be mounted to the side of something like to a wall or to the side of an air conditioner condenser unit. So they have these fairly strong brackets on either side with uh, slotted holes so you can um, put a couple screws on there and hang them on the side of something. Um, I'm going to try to utilize those to mount a piece of wood on here that will then hold the batteries and the sone alert. So I've cut a three and a half inch tall, 11 inch wide piece of quarter inch plywood and that'll sit on the floor. The reason I made it all the way down to the bottom was because these are not holes, they're slots and I think even if I tightened the screw up quite a lot and just had a narrow strip along here it might fall down so I want it sitting on the floor and those two slots will just hold it to the side of the pump. So I just need to figure out which size screws I'm using now. Well a number 17 drill fits that just about perfectly. 
And if I look at my torn up chart of drill sizes, I see that a close tolerance number 18 drill is appropriate for an 836 or an 832. So probably an 832 bolt would be good there. All right, I've got my two 832 clearance holes. I've got my 832 by a half inch bolts, nuts, and threw in a couple of uh, internal star washers just for the heck of it. To secure the battery holder and the sonar alert, uh, I decided a 440 was a good size screw and all I had was these short machine screws. So I've drilled a uh, tap size hole and tapped for 440. Now obviously you can tap wood, it's never as good as metal, but I'm using uh, four screws for the battery holder so between them it should have plenty of grip even when trying to wrench the batteries out of the clip. And the sonar alert just needs to hold its own weight so I think that'll be fine. Well that worked out even better than I expected. The uh, screws didn't go through the wood, they had plenty of grip on the threads so I could snug them up pretty good without overdoing it and I have no doubt that this will hold just fine. So now I need to mount it on the side of the pump and wire up the wires and uh, see how that turns out. Alright, that's on there. I chose to put the uh, 832 bolts in from the back. I used a half inch here and a three quarter inch here because I decided to put this cable clamp on here to uh, secure these. I actually soldered the wires in the proper circuit and um, then wrapped them with electrical tape and put all of that in one bundle that I could clamp securely in this one cable clamp on that one screw. So it keeps the wires more or less in an orderly place. And now it's just a matter of installing the batteries. This uh, battery holder is really a tight one. Okay, well I can't test it uh, right now because the cover's back on, but I'm confident it'll work when I get it to the relative's house. Uh, the other things to keep in mind about this while I'm on the subject is it comes with the 3 8 inch ID hose if you get the, the T option on the part number, but they recommend using a hose clamp which does not come with it, rather perversely. It seems like they could have included the hose clamp. And this isn't actually the one, it's just one I had handy here. I've got another one upstairs that's more the right size which I'll take with me. And the other thing is, um, since this is coming from a dehumidifier and not a uh, regular in fixed installation uh, air conditioning condenser, which would normally be drained through a PVC pipe, uh, the portable dehumidifier, as most of them do, has a garden hose fitting tucked up under uh, inside above its own tank. and. Uh, Sometimes it'll come out the back, sometimes it comes out through a little hatch on the side. The one that's at my relative's house has a hatch on the side and then you can run a garden hose uh, or any hose with a garden hose fitting on it in through that hole and then it screws onto the, the fitting on the inside of the dehumidifier. And if you don't do that, then the water just runs out the end of that fitting and drops into the tank. That's the way that works. Uh, so I needed to go to the hardware store and buy an appropriate short piece of hose that would go from the dehumidifier down only a foot or two and into this. And uh, what I chose to do is just get a washing machine hose, which is typically fairly short in the first place and has a female garden hose fitting on each end. So I just need to cut that off at the proper length and they caution that when you do that, you don't just cut the hose straight. You want to cut it at an angle. So imagine this is the, the garden hose here. You want to cut it at something maybe like a 45 degree angle. 
so when it sits down on the bottom it can't possibly push down in such a way that it restricts the flow of uh, condensate water from the dehumidifier into here that with that uneven bottom it it's not going to lay in such a way that it can possibly plug the uh, the discharge so that's another consideration and uh, the other stuff I need to take with me well I'm taking that just in case I have to redo some of the wiring and uh, some one wrap velcro if I need to tie the discharge hose to something to keep it in place and some zip ties I think I'm also going to get a, well, I'm sure they've got coat hanger wire, but I'm thinking if it has to snake over the edge of the sink or something to, to drain, I want to give the tubing more rigidity, so I'll probably do something like bend up a piece of coat hanger wire and zip tie it or electrical tape it or whatever to the side of the tubing to give the tubing that curved shape that it needs to, to hook into the edge of the sink. That may not be necessary, but it's nice to be prepared. And... Uh, I think that's all I've got to do about that at this point. We'll see how it turns out. All right, that worked out pretty well. The new washing machine hose that I cut off short comes out the hatch on the side, goes into one of the holes on the little giant pump, and then its hose, in this case, goes up over a bar and into the bar sink and by going up and then back down it provides a certain amount of siphoning action and uh, I verified that there's condensate going into the pump uh, pump reservoir and that when I poured about half a gallon of water into the other port that it pumped it out so that seems to be pretty successful and uh, That was just tipping it enough that the high, high level float switch activated. So I verified that the alarm is still working. So this is the revised setup here. I've changed it a couple of times. I first had it coming out at a slight angle and then an elbow and then going down through a pipe. And then I changed it to uh, this slightly different thing with a, uh, an angle, whatever that is, 45 degree angle or 30 degree angle or something. And then it's cut into a piece of pipe that's more like a, uh, a trough that kind of goes down at that angle, like that. And it actually does set in it about like that, so that gives it even more of a slope, but it definitely cannot be plugged in there. <laughs> 